I'm Ivor Benjamin, president of the American Heart Association, and with me are Dr. John Warner, immediate past president, and Dr. Robert Harrington, president-elect for the American Heart Association. And we are here at ESC 2018 in Munich, Germany, and we will review for AHA Science News some of the highlights of the clinical trials that have been presented here in Munich. So John, well, let me start with you. So I think one uh, takeaway from ESC this year has been a, a deeper understanding of, of what we know and what we don't know around aspirin therapy. And so particularly in the primary prevention space and one, one series of trials, the ASCEND trials were pivotal in, in sort of answering some questions that have been longstanding um, around primary prevention and diabetes, patients with diabetes, but also generating some interesting points for discussion as we begin to think about how we might build on our knowledge base for those. So the ASCEND trial was uh, had two, essentially two arms, uh, and one was the, the treatment of patients with diabetes uh, with no prior cardiovascular disease with aspirin or with placebo, followed for right around seven years of follow-up, and that's one branch of the ASCEND trial. And this was an interesting find. There was a reduction in serious vascular events from 9.6% uh, in the placebo arm to 8.5% in the patients uh, treated with aspirin. So an important clinical finding, which unfortunately was balanced by an increase in serious bleeding from 4.1% in the aspirin-treated patients, 3.3% in the patients treated with placebo. So a 12% reduction in vascular events, but an increase in major bleeding of, of 33%. So Again, the, you know, an important finding for us and suggests that we have more work to do, most likely, in finding patients who might derive that benefit and, and the decrease in serious vascular events and finding out those at highest risk for bleeding, particularly in that population with diabetes mellitus. The other side of the ASCEND trial was the treatment of patients, again, with diabetes mellitus with no prior cardiovascular disease with omega-3 fatty acids. And the idea there, again, could we find an improvement in preventing vascular events and this trial was a, was a negative trial. There was absolutely no, in, no benefit in patients uh, in, in, uh, in lowering vascular events in, with treatment with omega-3 fatty acids. So this was another important finding because a lot of what our database of, of knowledge has been built around is in secondary prevention with, with omega-3 fatty acids. So this is a patient deemed at least philosophically to be at a higher risk because of their having diabetes mellitus but actually didn't drive any benefit. So an important piece of data is the primary prevention story with omega-3 fatty acids involved. So two important findings from this very well done clinical trial. Bob, what, 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 what trials or highlights for you? So the big one I'm gonna highlight is the ARRIVE trial. And ARRIVE, building upon the, John, the comments that John made, also deals with the primary prevention question in aspirin. Why is this so important? It's important because we absolutely know that aspirin is beneficial in the secondary prevention of uh, atherosclerotic events in our patients with proven atherosclerotic disease. We know that. There's more than 200,000 patients in randomized clinical trials that have shown us that. We don't know the dose of aspirin that's most optimal to balance the, uh, the bleeding and the ischemic risks, but there's a trial ongoing supported by PCORI that's going to answer that question. The primary prevention, though, is a tough one because we have very inconsistent guidelines across the globe. Uh, some advocate it in some settings of primary prevention, some don't advocate it. So this is a really important question from a societal public health perspective to answer. What they didn't arrive is they were interested in taking a moderate risk group of patients using the uh, CBD risk score calculators and then to randomize those patients to low dose aspirin or not, placebo. Uh, couple of interesting things. First off, they did not get a moderate risk group of patients. Uh, despite attempts to do so, they ended up enrolling a low risk group of patients. Secondly, they showed no benefit, no benefit of aspirin therapy at low doses in this group of patients at low risk in reducing ischemic risk. However, aspirin did increase bleeding risk. So now I think this adds to what we've learned in Ascend, that in a low-risk group of patients, there is not a role routinely for aspirin therapy to prevent ischemic events. However, there's a secondary analysis within it that does show that there is a reduction in first myoclonal function with aspirin. Mm -hmm. So as with uh, Ascend, 
Still more work to do to understand, might there be groups of people, groups of patients who would benefit from aspirin therapy, but from a public health policy perspective, we certainly can't recommend it broadly uh, to reduce all ischemic events in groups of patients who are at low risk. And more, more work to be done assessing the whole gradient of risk. And that's the other piece I think is particularly important now. Because this trial was designed to answer a very important question, didn't quite get there in terms of looking at the patients we probably have the most ambiguity, ambiguity about. And so more work to be done there. Yeah, no, I, and I think we, we had talked on earlier editions of these videos on global leaders. And that's one of the trials that raises this question about if you have relatively high risk, meaning you've had an ischemic event, you've had a PCI procedure, how long should you go mm -hmm. and with what antiplatelet regimen? So a lot of important information from this meeting. And I think what we're going to do is enter an era of more personalizing of antithrombotic therapy. And certainly these trials that we've talked about so far help us in that regard. That would, that would be a, quite a challenge, would you say? Um, the standard model for a randomized trial is uh, one size fits all. Yeah, but how, how do you then <laughs> begin to start personalizing? It's a great question. But I think what we're seeing now, I will be because there have been no new antithrombotic agents. Yeah. If you think about a ticagrelor, which is one of the newer ones that's been studied, mm -hmm. those results were reported out in 2009. Nice. And so now what you're starting to see are strategy trials, which combinations, for how long, for who. So I think that the field is recognizing, to answer your question, rather than just looking at one regimen for everyone, what's the various strategies that might be beneficial for individual patients? It's going to have implications, especially for guidelines, really being able to help the practicing uh, clinician really make those decisions. It's absolutely going to help guidelines. And I think what we as the Heart Association have to think about is how do we also provide tools that help interpret those guidelines at the point of care? I think that that's the way to go. Would you think? I absolutely think that. So um, along those lines of uh, personalized therapy, the trial that actually I uh, find to be quite a positive trial here at um, ESC 2018 is the efficacy and safety of tapamidus in transthyrethrin amyloid cardiomyopathy, which is the ATTR ACT trial. As we mentioned in one of these earlier videos, uh, when you sort of think about the broad field of heart failure, we have heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, we have heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Well, mutations in this gene can actually present at one or the other form of heart failure. You have to have a high index of suspicion actually to make the diagnosis of amyloid cardiomyopathy. And it's a rare disease. It has real confounding issues for diagnosis. And typically, it used to require actually having a biopsy. Well, it turns out that technician scintigraphy is a highly sensitive and specific way of actually making a diagnosis. And in this trial, you're actually able to transition from using a biopsy to basically just doing imaging. So the implications, by the way, this was a positive trial. Two different doses, either 80 milligrams, um, you know, 20 milligrams, clearly showed significant reductions in all-cause mortality, improvement in terms of functional activity, as well as, of course, it means that we now have, have an opportunity for patients who have certain inheritable as well as acquired forms of cardiomyopathy that we actually be able to have an intervention. And the only reason that this will work, in my opinion, is if as clinicians, we actually have a high index of suspicion, make the appropriate diagnosis. And it's a result of the fact that there was basic research looking at different types of protein misfolding diseases that are called proteinopathies, an observation that was made that a polymorphism was able to actually stabilize a different mutation that then led to, if you will, the discovery science to identify a small molecule that's able to, if you will, take a mutation, maintain it in its soluble form, and that's how you're able to now have a phase three international trial being able to have a positive benefit. So when we talk about precision medicine, when we think about all that investment that we've done in basic research, we've been able to come full circle to now have a positive benefit in this particular space. But this is a real success. It's pretty amazing to think how far that our understanding of amyloid cardiomyopathies has come even just in the last 10 years. And so I think you're right. I think uh, there was a period of time where we were almost reluctant to look for it because we didn't have anything to do for it. And now I think we, this is a very promising trial and a very promising development. 
to understanding and treating a disease that has been very difficult for cardiologists and most importantly for patients and their families for a long period of time. Yeah, I mean, it's really a disease you have to think about when you're seeing a patient with new onset heart failure. And particularly in our older patients, you have to think about this. And, uh, and then you have to know how to go down a diagnostic pathway. And I agree with John. I mean, if there was no therapy, why pursue that pathway? Right, right. But now with a therapy, it opens up, oh, well, I better think about it. And right. I better know how to make the diagnosis. Right. And it actually turns out that um, this actually turns out there are at least 121 mutations that are known. But there are certain specific mutations that actually have a high prevalence in African Americans. So as much as this is an international audience, there is even more to be done in that particular space. And then it continues to advance what we call molecular therapy, really targeted therapy based on what we know. Cystic fibrosis has always been a heralded example. Now we actually, the cardiology community, can point to this. And so we hope that this, the addition, this will provide, provide proof of concept for us to continue that space. Well, um, we've had an amazing uh, and exciting time here uh, in Munich. Um, I don't know if there are any final thoughts, either John or Bob. <laughs> it's been a great meeting. And, you know, there's a lot of trials that have been quote unquote negative um, during this meeting. But I think the information gained from these very well done clinical trials has changed practice, maybe not in a transformative way, but it answered a lot of questions that were lingering around the patients that where we have gaps in our knowledge base around treating aspirin. It's a great example. There's more work to be done. But these are relevant findings, I think, particularly for the practicing physician, not only cardiologists, but any practicing physician, primary care physicians and others. So I really think it's been a very good meeting, lots of robust science, and it's a, a great time here in Munich with our friends.